Coming up next on Passion Struck. Shame is a huge factor. We don't even realize how much of it is keeping us from having the conversations, being sexual, being in our bodies. And I actually talk about different kinds of shame in the book, break it into different ways that we experience it. And so once you start to look at that, you kind of recognize that it's literally everywhere. The thing about shame is the more we shed light on our shame, we learn to like kind of talk about this stuff. It does kind of go away. It's like shedding light on our darkness. It's so pervasive in uh, why we don't want to talk about sex, why we don't feel comfortable in our bodies. It's body shame. Shame is really heavy. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become Passion struck. I am absolutely thrilled and honored to have the one and only Dr. Emily Morse on Passion Struck. Welcome, Emily. Thank you for having me, John. This is fun. I'm excited. Well, I am so ecstatic that we're here with you today doing the launch of your brand new book, Smart Sex How to Boost Your Sex IQ and Own Your Pleasure. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, as a fellow podcaster, I also wanted to congratulate you on your acceptance last year into the Podcast Hall of Fame. That is such an incredible honor. Thank you. Thank you. It was quite an honor. Yeah, it was exciting. Well, your show, Sex with Emily, has been one of the longest running podcasts, and you started it, if I have the date right, in 2005. (laughs) Yeah. Which at that time, Many people didn't even know what podcasting really was. What drove you to use that as an avenue to express your voice? Oh, God. Yeah, it's a great question. I want want to remind you that people didn't really know what podcasting was until about five years ago. It didn't really become really popular and hot. It took a long time to get people to just understand what it was. But at the time, I was coming off of making a documentary and I was really involved in like journalism and I was creating a cable access show called Searching for Sex in San Francisco. Anyone can have a cable access show, by the way, like anyone can have a podcast. So I was already on the path to find something that was easy to do that I could get my story out there. I wanted to interview people about this certain topic. So I was doing cable access show for a few months and I had an intern at the time who said, have you heard of podcasting? It's just starting. I read about it. Let's do a podcast because we could only, because I wasn't that interested in the video part. I love the audio part, especially for what I'm talking about. So that's what happened. I just heard about it and I started, I hired some, a guy off Craigslist to work sound and that's came over my house. I invited a bunch of friends over, interviewed them. And that's how we started it. I didn't know it was going to become like a whole thing, but I really loved the medium. Well, when I think back to that time, there was you, there was Jordan Harbinger, Rob Greenlee, who are all now still doing it, which is amazing, but really pioneers for the rest of us. So Uh, truly an inspiration for me. Oh, thank you. In the 17 years that you've been doing the show, you must have encountered some really different scenarios from the questions that your listeners give you. Does one ring out as strikingly memorable for you? I'm trying to think. I, it's funny, I get asked that question. There's nothing that stands out because if you even think about this, I've answered tens of thousands of questions, emails, listeners for so long that it, there's nothing that stands out. But what always surprises me is that every single day, there's somebody who is dealing with the same exact challenges. I guess what I'm saying is that on a weekly basis, the questions are exactly the same. No matter, I've been listening to all these years, there's really just five questions that can be branched out to other areas. But it just amazes me for this long. And out of my listeners have learned a lot. But I think the fact that some of the same things keep happening, a lot of the confusion, people don't know 
their bodies. They've never talked about sex. They don't, I've never had an orgasm. Like that's a surprise to me, but I don't think that there's any one caller or question that stands out. And I always said to myself, I got to get a better answer for that, but I don't have one. Yeah. That's like the question I get, which is who is your favorite interview been? And for me, it's easy. It's been my sister. I don't have that either. That feels, I don't know. It was like picking my favorite child. Like I love every episode I do. I love all my guests. I think you learn from everybody. So it's hard to say. Yeah. You and I were talking before we started the show. I grew up in a very Catholic family, Michigan graduates like you, going to parochial school all the way from kindergarten throughout high school. And we were basically taught that having sex made you a bad person. And I remember this horrible experience. I'm a freshman in high school and the entire freshman class gets taken into an auditorium where we're forced to watch a video of a woman getting an abortion and which was just shocking that there were girls crying it very disturbing i'm not oh sure people God. would do that today but why because of how we are educated are we taught to live in fear shame and embarrassment when it comes to sex Oh, wow. That is a powerful story. I felt that. I haven't heard that story directly from anybody. I know that those kind of classes existed. I always say that we're told to hate sex and we're it's so fear-based sex education, but that's extreme. So that's just a really powerful story. So I, I'm imagining the women in your class grown up now, years and years later, what they've had to contend with. Right? Hopefully they found their way to my show or they've gotten some help in it because that's going to scare kids at such a young age. So there's a spectrum of that. But how many kids are taught about sex is a variation of what you just described. They may or may not have sex education. About 17 states require sex education to be medically accurate if they teach it in the United States at all. And typically when they do teach it, Maybe it's a day or two. It's more based in fear. Don't get pregnant. Don't get an SDI. Better off, don't have sex. There's nothing about pleasure. There's nothing about why we would even want to have sex. And so those are the messages that we carry with us until somebody else talks to about sex. But guess what, John? Nobody talks about sex. Most people are very shameful and fearful talking about sex, even with their partners of years and years. People have been in their relationships. Every day I get these calls from people, 10, 15, 20 years. They've never took that. They've talked to me more about sex in a five minute call or an email to me than they ever have to a partner. So here we've created this culture of people, decades, where sex is shamed, it's shrouded in mystery. And even if people are like, well, I didn't have that experience. My parents were pretty open about it. Or I had grown into a very liberal school. That's great. But still, even if you were told it's okay, and your parents were cool with it, there's still a lot more to learn. We still are realizing that so many people that grew up with porn, like in their pocket, right? You were the digital generation that grew up with an iPad in your hand. You've been seeing images of sex and porn since you were maybe eight years old. And so now in absence of the sex talk, or maybe very minimal sex talk, it's now replaced by pornography. And what you've seen is that sex. So now I know nothing about sex, or maybe I know it's going to get me pregnant and that's scary. And then I see porn. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so I'm constantly, I think of what a lot of what I do is help people to unlearn and then relearn what sex actually is. So the fear, the shame, the embarrassment, that all comes from a lot of lack of information, misinformation, growing up in conservative religious backgrounds, and just the conversation about sex not being accurate or helpful. Yeah, I recently did an interview with Dr. Will Cole. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but yeah. Yeah, he has a new book out called Gut Feelings. But we talked a lot about a term that he's created called shame flammation, which oh, is I that chronic love that stress. Term. Yeah, chronic stress creates this continuance of shame and inflammation, and they both interact with each other. But when I was reading your book, you talked about how many people are not having a great sex life and experiencing pleasure because of this problem that's rooted in shame. And I think it's so powerful because you don't really think about it that way. But in many ways, whether it's body image or other things that we tell ourselves, shame really does come into 
how we feel about ourselves and how much we're willing to express ourselves to another person. It's true. Shame is a huge factor. We don't even realize how much of it is keeping us from having the conversations, being sexual, being in our bodies. And I actually talk about different kinds of shame in the book. I break it into different ways that we experience it. And when you start to look at that, you recognize that it's literally everywhere. The thing about shame is the more we shed light on our shame, we learn to talk about this stuff. It does go away. It's like shedding light on our darkness, but it's so pervasive in why we don't want to talk about sex, why we don't feel comfortable in our bodies, body shame. There's imposter syndrome. There's, we should be certain places that we're not. Yeah. Shame is really heavy. We feel shame too growing up. Like we might even feel shame from if we touch ourselves, right? So even our first sexual experiences, if we masturbated, we could also feel shameful. And then we might feel shame every time we have sex because we still have these messages that sex was wrong, right? So Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the Catholic religion, I was brought up to believe that masturbation was a sin. So that's probably true with many different religious practices. Well, that's really true with many practices. So not only that, like we should talk about masturbation because I talk about that a lot in the book. That's actually a lot of you are shocked when I say this, but I want to reframe masturbation as part of being sexually healthy. It's actually part of being really connected to yourself and having better sex is having that relationship with yourself. For many people, they did grow up with messages around masturbation and they might not even remember it. Like they might've been at a very young age, maybe even pre-verbal and they put their hands on their pants and maybe a parent said, oh no, don't do that. That's dirty. That's wrong. So even before they remember it, they know that touching themselves is wrong. And the reason why masturbation is so important is because it's how we connect with ourselves and how we learn our bodies and learn how to explain to our partners what feel good. Actually having an orgasm is part of being sexually healthy. It helps with our dopamine levels and our stress and uh, help with our skin, helps boost our immune system. So there's all these ways that it's great, but if we're told that it's shameful, then you get into a relationship with somebody. And there's a lot of people who just feel like offended if their partner masturbates and they feel like it's disrespectful. They feel betrayed. There's shame around it too. So people feel then they shame their partners, right? So it's a cycle that just... It doesn't end unless we decide that we want to take control and have agency over our bodies and our own sexuality, which I think is a choice. Anyone can make that choice, maybe today. Yeah, well, I know one of the things you talk about is mindful masturbation in the book. Why is that important? Mindful masturbation is important because let's say you do have a masturbation practice. A lot of us just masturbate because we know what we like and we hit it and we quit it and that's done. And that's fine. There is no judgment on that. I'm glad you're taking care of yourself. However, being more mindful, I'm very into mindfulness, meditation, and presence. First, let me say this is that one of the most common complaints I hear from people and questions I get people is how do I be present for sex? Why am I so distracted in the bedroom? My thoughts are wandering. I'm thinking about other things. I can't get in the moment. I'm fantasizing about other things. They feel like they can't be present for their partner. And that's a huge reason why people don't want to have sex instead of pleasure. So mindful masturbation kind of merges the two and just teaching you mindfulness practice while also focusing on your pleasure. So if you're used to doing one thing the same way, like masturbating the same way, that's fine. This is more of an intentionality around masturbation where you're slowing down and you are setting the time to just explore. It's not just about the goal of orgasm. The goal is exploration and taking time, you lock the door, maybe turn off your phone, you're not looking at porn or anything else. And again, I just want to say side note, I don't judge porn. I think that porn has great use. It can be titillating. We learn from it, watch with a partner. That's great. For this practice in particular, take some time to just breathe. And I talk a lot of the book, probably more than people would realize about breath work and meditation and slowing down because that's how we're going to be feel more embodied and connected. So mindful masturbation is just a practice of being present, being mindful with your touch, taking time to explore and getting curious. Like, how does it feel when I rub my hand on my like inner elbow slowly up my arm or down my legs or teasing ourselves, like doing the things that we might want a partner to do. And then we start to really learn and pay attention to, and then we go back to our breath if our mind starts to wander. So I walk people through this, but even if you do it for 10, 15 minutes at a time and just think about what 
get curious. Like what actually feels good? What doesn't feel good? What am I learning that I could share with a partner? What could help me get closer to having more pleasure? What doesn't feel good? Because a lot of times we are very, we're having sex with somebody or we're in a relationship and we're either people pleasing or we are perform having sex more performatively. I think this looks good to my partner. Or I hope this looks okay or feels good for them. Doesn't really feel great for me. So I want people to take their sex life back and realize that they are responsible for their own pleasure, their own orgasm. And this is a great way to start. Yeah. Do you ever run into the situation where a listener has talked to you about that they get more pleasure out of masturbation than they do having sex with their partner? A lot. Yeah. That's really common. I remember the first time I heard that. It was right when I started, a friend of mine said, Emily, I got to tell you, good luck with this because most of my friends would rather masturbate than have sex with their wife. Because when I started this, I was not the sex expert. So come to find out that a lot of people, no matter what their gender, do prefer to have best because they know that they're going to get there. They know how to do it. They know that I pleasure to please themselves. But that to me is somebody who hasn't quite done the work yet of connecting with a partner on a deep, intimate level. And to me, there's might be a lot of shame as well. Like they don't feel comfortable being that intimate with somebody or there's fear. In my book, I get into the pleasure thieves which is stress, trauma, and shame. And those are the things that's keeping us from deeply connecting to our partners, actually. So I would ask people who feel that way, what's going on in your relationship where you feel like you're not able to be deeply intimate with your partner sexually or otherwise, I would say. Do you think if someone has unfortunately experienced rape or some type of child abuse or situation like that, that can lead to the situation occurring? I think that many of us have experienced trauma, whether it's assault, rape, or just traumatic childhood. It lives in our body. So a lot of us experience trauma, but let's go to the big T trauma. If you have had rape or assault, I 100% recommend there's no other advice I have than to go to therapy. And to work on your trauma because trauma doesn't go away because time passes. It actually gets deeper and great and got a cellular level into who we are. And so there's some wonderful trauma therapies that are great for this kind of stuff that re can rewire your brain. I'm really into EMDR therapy. I talk about that a lot on my show. Um, you can find more. I think it's mdria.org. And it's eye movement therapy, rewires the neural pathways of your brain. It's a way of talking about the trauma and release of our body because when something traumatic happens as we go into fight or flight, no matter what kind of trauma it is, and we're in fight or flight, we are no longer in our sympathetic nervous system, right? We're always in a state of stress. And that's not going to change when we get into the bedroom. Therapy is just a must for people. I think therapy, honestly, I will prescribe it to everybody. I think we all could benefit from some kind of therapy, having someone to talk to, or better yet, an embodiment practice. In therapy, which I would like to think EMDR is that you're breathing and paying attention to things in our body. There's a reason why the body keeps score. That book has been on the bestseller list for almost two years because people are realizing, I think it was a shock. We were always told that our head, our brains, and our bodies were separate. And we realize that it's all intertwined, that anything that's happened to us that is traumatic, whatever it has been, lives in the tissues of our body. The issues are in our tissues. So when you go to have sex with somebody and be really intimate, that's going to trigger a extreme trauma response or just shutting down, disassociation, your head leaving your body, just a disconnection. And I had Dr. Christopher Palmer, who's a Harvard psychologist on the show earlier last year and came out with this groundbreaking book called Brain Energy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but in yeah. it, he came to the startling conclusion that all mental disorders are metabolic disorders. So there's definitely a gut brain connection. I totally agree with what you're saying. I think so too. I wrote a little bit about the gut connection in my book too, because I think we're going to find that it is all related. What happens in our brains related to our genitals, like you're not getting erections, like it's something having your brain, it's blood flow. It's all connected to your diet, your exercise, nutrition. That's fascinating. I totally believe that. We're learning more and more, thank God, about all of this. <laughs> thank God. Thank well, God. I'm, I'm going to go back to how you got started in all of this. In the book, you wrote that at 35, you thought your best sex was behind you, 
but you ended up finding the exact opposite was true. If the listener isn't familiar with you, which some of my listeners might not be, you actually have a doctorate in human sexuality. And when I was doing the research, I found that there are only two accredited programs for this. And it's interesting because when I looked at the curriculum, it dives into exploring the intersection of power and sexuality. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Let me just say that there aren't that many credit universities and it was really hard to find a place to go. I was living in San Francisco at the time and I went back to school and got my doctorate. I hear from people all the time who want to go to school for it and there's just really not, there's maybe more programs now. I'm a sexologist to study the, how we are sexual beings and so power and sexuality, it's funny, is that what it said in the description of my school, power and sexuality? When I think of power, I think of gender roles. And I think about how we, I think about the masculine and the feminine, and I think about energetics and polarities and that I don't want to go off on a whole like woo land here, but I feel <laughs> like there's a lot about internalized misogyny for women. And there's a lot of power dynamics where we feel like we have to, I think about sex being a power exchange where a lot of times the, the feminine energy is not really allowed to express our sexuality. There's been a lot of repression of the feminine and so I think a lot of sexuality, when you think about, I talk about polarity in the book. So the flip side of that is that in every sexual connection, there needs to be a, a charge. I call it masculine and feminine in the book, but it could also be two men, two women. It could be any genders together. But if you think about it, somebody has to lead and somebody has to follow just for, for energy, for attraction to happen. If there's two people who are passive in the bedroom together who aren't initiating, sex isn't going to happen. So it's more about energetics and understanding like a power exchange to create eroticism. It's a bit complicated subject. You get caught up on the gender here. And what I really talk about is the, the different sides of that. When you think of two magnets or the positive and negative, you can't have two positives or two negatives. So I talk to you about what is the energetics that you want to bring? The feminist typically brings the energy and the movement and the masculine is more of the container. And so how we all play together energetically is a really important thing to understand is the, or the power dynamics in your relationship. So hope that makes sense. That explains it. Yeah. Well, I, as I was thinking about it last year, I interviewed, I don't know if you know him there in LA with you, John Kim, he's known as the angry therapist and Vanessa yes. Higgins. And yes. we were talking about why relationships fail or why sexual relationships fail. And as I got to think about this power and sexuality connection, in my mind, I came up with often there's a power play. And they said one of the biggest issues that happens in relationships is competition. Do you think mm -hmm. that can impact sex life? Huh, competition. For I... instance, you start getting jealous of your spouse or you start competing with them because maybe they are the aggressor in the bedroom or something like that. Listen, everything's gonna impact the bedroom. I want people to understand that it's not about learning certain positions. I will definitely get into those in the book. I give positions, I give my best oral sex tips and everything is there. But if you've got these underlying issues in your relationship where you're competitive with each other or you're threatened or you're jealous or in the bedroom, someone's initiating the other person is in you resentments. That's a huge thing I see is that resentments build up over time in a relationship. And if we don't deal with the resentments, we're not going to be turned on, aroused and wanting to have sex with our partners. Well, I think those resentments really get down to intentional choices that we're making and this podcast is really about those micro choices that we make every day of our lives that are taking us closer to achieving our goals in life. And you reference this in the book through the term productivity and creating a life of pleasure. And I believe that sex is one of those areas where how we apply our intentionality towards it plays a very huge role. Would you agree? I absolutely agree that we have to be more intentional with our sexuality and that productivity, where I talk about being intentional and being productive with sex, I was writing the book, I thought, we think of that pleasure as such a hedonistic pursuit and that we don't really deserve pleasure until we check everything off our list. We've had dinner, we get dessert, we've worked really hard all week, we get to have a, go out for drinks, we get to go on vacation once a year. But I do flip it in the book and say pleasure is productivity. The more times we think about pleasure in my life, and I'm not just talking about sexual pleasure, I'm talking about just pleasure in general, going into nature, seeing your friends, petting your dog, going, eating the food you love. 
that that's actually going to help you be more productive in other areas of your life. But this whole like restrictive culture, we're not deserving, we feel guilt and shame around pleasure is actually anti-productive, is not productive. So I want to reframe the pursuit of pleasure. I give tools in the book, how to look at your pleasure score and how much of your life you're actually spending in a pleasurable place and pursuing pleasure and doing things that make you feel good and how often you're not. And I think it's pretty startling to look at how often, how restrictive we are as a culture and how much we keep ourselves from experiencing things that make us feel good. I recently interviewed uh, Gaia Bernstein, who's an attorney at Seton Hall. She teaches law there and she has a new book out called Unwired. And we were having this discussion about digital addiction. When it comes to digital addiction, we're making small choices unintentionally about how we're using it that inadvertently become huge ones. And I was thinking as I was preparing for this, that the same thing happens when it comes to sex, because we make small choices to either inhibit it, or maybe we have different ways we want to explore it that our partner does. Maybe we're not letting our true self out. Maybe we're not discussing it. But I think the more we repress that and we make these tiny choices to ignore or to, mm -hmm. you see where I'm going with it? I yes, think that's inadvertently... such a wonderful point, John. That is so true. We don't we absolutely sabotage ourselves and make so many choices that keep us from having satisfying, fulfilling sex and intimacy. Like I want people to remind people that sex isn't just penetration. Like I'm talking about intimacy. And yes, we are keeping ourselves from that all the time with little micro decisions that are affecting the macro for sure. Wow. That's really powerful. Going along those lines that intentionality that we have really has a lot to do with self-awareness. And I think many of us, because of digital addiction and other things, is we're spending so much time being distracted by so many other things around us that we're not spending enough time with ourselves understanding what we really want to experience pleasure or happiness. I was hoping maybe you could explain that link between self-awareness and sex. Yes, absolutely. I'm so caught up on those micro decisions we're making. I'm like, wow, yeah, self-awareness. So Self-awareness is one of the pillars of sex IQ that I talk about in the book. And self-awareness is really just knowing ourselves, paying attention to slowing down and thinking about what do I know about myself sexually? What turns me on? What gets me in the mood? What brings me closer to sex? What takes me away from sex? What are the decisions I'm making that are gonna allow me to feel more sexual? What are the ones that make me less sexual? What have I liked in the past? What do I like in the future? What do I know about myself? We've all put sex in this container. We compartmentalize it. And we think it's like this separate thing that sort of magically happens and then we go about our life. But by thinking about it intentionally and thinking there is so much to know about ourselves sexually, what we like and what we don't like, it doesn't have to be so mysterious because we are making decisions that are keeping us from sex. So for example, Self-knowledge would be, I know that I don't like sex. This is just an example. I will not have sex in the morning because I'm exhausted. I like to get up. I like to work out. But in the evenings before 10 o'clock, that seems to be the sweet spot if it gets too late. Because what I'm finding is in relationships a lot, people need to like troubleshoot or hack their way to understanding their sex life. It's a way of like really thinking about what do I know works? Because otherwise there's people in a relationship and they're, let's say there's always one person, there's always the high desire and the low desire part, or there's always one person initiating and one person not initiating, which is a dynamic that is inherent. And unfortunately, two high desire partners never get together. So you're all in, okay. <laughs> Everyone's okay. We just got to learn to troubleshoot it. So how you do that, I just want to tell people this too. You want to have sex, right? You're with a partner, you love, you're with them, you're in a relationship. And if you are in a relationship, like sex has got to happen to be so that way your roommates, like if you're not having sex and you want sex, you want to connect, we got to figure out how to get there so you do want sex. So self-knowledge is one of the pillars of understanding. Think about the three most memorable times you've had sex. So the last three times you wanted to have sex, that's how you're going to get knowledge. If you're like, what is she talking about? I know nothing. I don't pay attention. What was happening before that? What was building up to that time? That, well, you want vacation? Like, oh, I love vacation sex. Yeah, because you're not at home. You're not stressed. You're not staring at the same ceiling in the same bedroom doing the same things. Or maybe it was like you had a babysitter, like that you knew that you, like I said, you went out for dinner, you had a date night and you were able to leave the house and you were really with your partner. And you got to talk to them again, away from the kids. 
or you had just come back from exercise class and you felt like your endorphins going, the adrenaline, dopamine, right? So these are all the ways we would depack. And I think it's really easy for people to think when they don't want sex too. So I allow people to work reverse engineer it. Like I know that if I haven't worked out and this is a lot of what the book's about is setting our lives up to feel more sexual because we do a lot of things that just don't make us feel sexual. So like, I know if I work out, I'm in therapy, I take my supplements, I communicate well with my partner, then I'm going to be more likely ready for sex than not. How should we talk to our partner about sexual experimentation? Maybe someone's into bondage or someone is into anal sex, or maybe someone wants to experiment with someone of the same sex with their partner. How do you broach those types of conversations? It's a great question. I think you do it in the same way. I also say some people come to me and they're like, I know that I want to be with someone of the same sex, or I know that I want to have a threesome, or I know that, but we've never talked about sex. Okay. So you don't start with, Hey babe, good morning. Here's your coffee. Wouldn't a threesome be a good time? Like that is not speaking of coffee. I was here. That is not how you have these conversations. You have to build up to it, right? You have to like first say, like, are we good talking about sex? Have we decided that we want to be great lovers to each other? Do we both have a growth mindset around sex? And that's when you have to make sure that your partner's on board for it. And again, I encourage people to have these conversations when you first start dating someone. Because what I hear from a lot of people who are already married or connected for a long time, and they're like, oh God, we've never done it, which is also fine. That's like most of the planet right now, because going back to earlier in the conversation, most people don't have experience talking about sex. So this is a process. This is a process using three T's and saying, would you be open to that? I got to warn people that a lot of people, when we bring up sex for the first time with our partner, they go into fight or flight. They go into what did I do wrong? You're bringing up sex. Sex is our little thing that we do in the bedroom and we don't talk about it. What did I do wrong? I'm a terrible person. I'm a bad lover. Like we go, all these things go in our head. So you have to be prepared to be very comforting to your partner and say, listen, I know this might be awkward. I know this might be concerning. We've never talked about it, but I want you to know that I'd love to learn together how to be the best lovers ever, how to be comfortable talking about sex and to learn to explore. Would you be open to it? It's been useful for many couples over these years. Like they'll listen to my podcast together. And I used to just not really understand this, but People would say to me, like, we drove all the way from Chicago to Detroit and we listened to like your podcast the whole time, 10 hours, 12 hours. And I was thinking, that's a lot of podcasts. But what I realized is the way that I talk about sex is I normalize it. I talk about it like we're talking about the weather, like sunny with a chance of orgasms, right? And then people realize like, oh, why is it so weird? She can do it. These and Then they hear the callers, people call into the show. And they start to understand that it's a language or they can turn down and go, okay, what do you think about that? Dr. Emily says that we should download her yes, no, maybe list to have fun. Would you do that? Oh, maybe not. And it gets couples talking. It's like, I'm a conversation starter for them. And I understand the first time doing this is really terrifying to people, but it gets a whole lot easier. I was not born this way. I don't think I ever had a conversation about sex till I was 35. So everyone feels like they're, oh my God, no, it's okay to start where you're at. I think, John, I'm so grateful you have me on the show because I just know that this is my mission is to get people to feel comfortable talking about it. So I'm glad we're really getting into it here. Yeah, well, I think another thing that people have trouble with is let's say you're not satisfied with the sex that you're having with your partner. Maybe you're the female and you're having to fake an orgasm because it's just not hitting your spot. How do you recommend giving sexual feedback so that the other person responds in a way that's going to be powerful in helping both of you experience more pleasure? It's a really good question. One of the great ways to do is it's called the compliment sandwich. And the compliment sandwich is a very specific way to give constructive feedback that might be hard to give in a way that they can take the advice or take the suggestion and work with you on it and really hear what you're saying. And it goes like this. So think of the sandwiches, you've got two pieces of bread and you've got like the meat in the middle. So the first layer of bread would be, hey, I really would love to like, I'm going to tackle it. You said faking orgasms, which by the way, I opened the book with this, but like I faked orgasms. So I was like 35 with the partner. I should also let everyone know that only 20 to 30% of women have orgasms during penetration. That's what surprises me every day, that people still don't know that and that women walk around still feeling broken. I just talked to my friend's daughter who's 18. And 
she had five minutes alone with me and said, I'm with a boyfriend right now and I, I'm faking orgasm. So this is why I still do the work every day because here's somebody who's decades younger than I am and still is feeling like she has to fake it. So anyway, compliment sandwich. So I want to talk about our sex life and I want to say like, I love, I love our connection. You talk about something that you love, like I, or that you're really into. It is so hot the way you go down to me. Like our oral sex is next level. Like when I see you going down there and your tongue and the things you do feels amazing. And then you say, and I want you to know that sometimes I realize that I'm more likely to have orgasms that way or with a finger or with some other things. But when we're having penetration, I feel like we're just not hitting the spot. And sometimes I feel like I'm about to orgasm. I might've even seemed like I'm having an orgasm or faked an orgasm, but I'm really not. I really know that this is the way I'm going to do it. And then you close it with, and I really think that if we can focus on other ways for me to have pleasure and for me to really be able to explain to you what I need, that our sex life is going to the next level. And then I'll be able to be a great lover to you and find what you need. And I can't wait to try all these things with you. So that's it. You come in with something that you're into, you give some feedback in the middle, and then you're like, why is this great for both of us? You fake orgasms. Like, I'm not saying that it's going to be done. And then you go back to, yeah, I'm learning about my body. I'm learning. I don't think that you would want that either. I'm so sorry, but this is all the things that I do like. I realized that I fake it because I wanted you to feel good. Like, right. The right partner is going to be like, okay. And then they're going to realize that like, it's not even all about orgasm, it's about connection and intimacy. And once you let go of all the pressure, there's going to be a lot more orgasms happening. I guarantee it. So audience, think about that muffaletto sandwich that you had for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to make sure we get into a couple of the core components of your book. And you mentioned it earlier. One of the areas that you really go into is something that you call sex IQ. Okay. What are the five pillars of sex IQ and why are they significant? Okay. The five pillars of sex IQ. These are five pillars that are directly impacting your sex life, your ability to be sexual, aroused, turned on, have orgasms, have pleasure. And I often think that people don't, didn't see the connection between them. So I'm giving you the pillars so you can learn to up-level your sex IQ. First one is embodiment. How embodied are we? How is my mind and my body connected so I can pick up on my physical and my mental cues and so I can be present during sex? So that's the first one. That's embodiment. And I give a lot of tips for, for feeling more embodied, like rec recognizing, remember I was talking about mindful masturbation. That's a great embodiment exercise. Where are my feeling sensations in my body? The next one is our health. And I think that it's your mental health and your physical health. Are you on a certain medication that's going to be impacting your ability to be turned on? Are you moving your body? Are you exercising? Blood flow is a huge connection to our ability to get aroused. Prioritize your wellness. The non-negotiables are nutrition, exercise, diet, therapy. Collaboration. Collaboration is about communication. To create meaningful and intimate sexual experiences, you need to be able to communicate and collaborate with your partner. You have to have these conversations because you could be really healthy, you could be really embodied, but if you've never talked about sex, it's going to be really hard to be an excellent giving lover. Fourth one is self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is there's so many environmental, physical, psychological factors that can help us from knowing ourselves from understanding ourselves. You must understand your arousal patterns, how you get turned on. What are all the things that are going to get me in the mood for sex? Like we talked about earlier and like knowing that and bringing that to the table and constantly monitoring what do I know about myself? And the last one is self-acceptance. We must love, accept, and find confidence in our body, who we are, how far we've come, how much experience we have to this day. Our bodies, they're changing all the time. Do we accept who we are, as sexual beings and know that we are worthy and deserving of pleasure right now, today. You and I already talked about collaboration as one of the key pillars. I wanted to dive into something in that health component, and that is how does poor sleep impact our sex life? Oh my God, poor sleep. And we're learning so much about sleep these days. If you are not sleeping, if you are like exhausted all the time, we know that poor sleep is impacting our mental health, our physical health. If you're not sleeping, there's no way that you're going to be in a state to be 
connected and aroused and turned on. You might not have a lot of blood flow. You might be having a lot of negative thoughts. You might be on a schedule that's not going to make you feel more embodied and present. And so sleep they're finding is impacting like every area of our life. So really you got to hack your sleep. There's so many great sleep tips right now, but it's like getting to bed at the same time every single night putting your phones outside the bedroom. Think about it. If we go into our bedroom to go in different times every night, we're on our phones, we're scrolling, scrolling. There's no room for arousal to come in, to feel connected to our body. And in fact, if we're just not going to bed, we're waking up in the middle of the night, our bodies are not going to be in the healthiest state to feel arousal. Like I'll do this with my partner. Like we leave our phones outside the bedroom. We're really, and again, I'm not perfect, but we are trying to go to bed at the same time. Keep TVs, screens outside the bedroom. Well, like, then you realize like we're here to connect, to be intimate. It's like there's more space, but literally our phones, our technology are coming in between us and our partners and our ability to feel sexual and have pleasure. Okay. And I wanted to ask you another question about sleep. And that is how does sleep and masturbation relate with each other? <laughs> masturbation can help us fall asleep. I think that that's a really big, another Current people, they're like, I never, I hear from people all the time. I never masturbate. I don't have time. I'm in a relationship. I don't need to. I'm not in a relationship. I'm going to wait till I get the partner. No, masturbation is a great way of you are having sleep issues. Masturbate. It's going to help you fall asleep. It helps us sleep better. It helps facilitate rest states. It's releasing all those hormones that can allow us to fall into a restful state while feeling some pleasures. Yeah. I would highly encourage people to pick up a masturbation practice if they want to learn to sleep better that it works for many people. <laughs> and I'm going to go back to emotional health here for a second and shame. Oftentimes we blame ourselves for drinking too much or smoking too much or eating too much junk food. We're spending too much time on our phones as we've been talking about, but people also blame themselves for possibly having an addiction to sex or maybe not having the sex life that they want. What causes the cycle of self-blame and how do you break free from blaming yourself for not having the sex life that you want? I think what causes it is just a lot of things. I think negative self-talk, not accepting our bodies. I would say it's like the opposite of all these pillars. Think about the opposite. You are beating yourself up. You don't feel good in your body. You are not connecting to a partner. You're not taking care of yourself sexually, maybe you've tried to have sex, and you're not able to get aroused, turned on, have an erection, have orgasms. You're doing everything that's antithetical to having great sex. So you're not going to feel very connected and you're going to continue to beat yourself up and not feel sexual. And I think that these are all the reasons that we feel woefully disconnected and not ready for sex. I think the cycle starts from not acknowledging that sex is important, not prioritizing and not paying attention to it. And then allowing all these other things to get into the way and to keep us from feeling connected and sexual. I think that we just don't prioritize sex. We think it's going to magically happen. And then when it doesn't happen, we literally don't know what to do about it. And so either we blame our partners or we blame ourselves. And so what I try to do in the book is I try to give people like, look behind the curtain. Are you on a medication? Are you not working out? Do you have resentments with your partner? Do you have untreated trauma? Do you walk around all day hating your body? Like literally saying, I don't like my body. I don't like that look. And then you expect you're going to get in the bedroom and you're going to feel sexual. So there's all these little things that we're doing every day, these little microaggressions to our bodies, to ourselves. And so as a result of that, we are just not turned on and ready for sex at all ever. Okay. I wanted to make sure I had some time to ask you some questions about sex. So there've been various studies that have occurred really starting in 2018 that are showing that adults are spending an average of five and a half hours on their phones and adolescents and teenagers are spending even more than that. And we all know that people are gaming, but more than that, they're living out their fantasies online. And I saw a podcast recently that Andrew Huberman did where he was talking about the negative impacts of porn on our lives. And I wanted to ask you, how does our relationship with porn impact our sex lives, both negatively, but also how could it be positive? It's a great question. I think that we, so let's talk about the positives first. So the positives of porn is that it can be a great tool to get ourselves aroused. We can learn some things from porn, especially if it's like ethical porn. There's some sites that I love that I think are 
more made for the female gaze and that's for the male gaze. It can be really hot to watch with a partner. Maybe there's like something you want to try or kink you want to try and you find a scene in porn and you can like show each other what your turn-ons are. I'm all for like tools helping us facilitate the sex life that we want to have. And porn in moderation is great. But like anything, we're talking about addictions, too much of anything is going to cause a problem, right? So we're talking about kids who grow up with porn. That's all that they're seeing, right? That's sex to them. And then for people, they start to realize that like it feels really good. I'm watching porn. That's the net. They feel safe watching porn. And then people can start to escalate their porn watching. So they're watching something and it's really hot. And then they're like, well, what could I watch that's even more extreme? By extreme, I mean, it's like maybe they're watching threesomes and then they're watching more like abusive porn or like gangbangs. And again, I'm very careful in my language. I don't speak in absolutes because for some people like watching a gangbang is like really hot every once in a while. That's fine. But I'm talking about people who like, they keep escalating to the point where they actually feel bad themselves. They're like, I'm not going to do this. Okay, now I'm going to watch. And then they can't stop. And it becomes this escalation. And it becomes this point where they actually can't get aroused and turned on with a partner. They can only get aroused from porn because we wire our brains around what we do the most of. So we get addicted to our phones in the same way. It's a distraction. Porn watching becomes this repetitive cycle. That's what sex becomes. It just becomes a replacement and addiction in that way. But addiction, I don't want it to get into it, but like in my field, like, oh, people are so like, you can't be addicted to sex. You can't be addicted. I don't love to use that language, but all I'm saying is that we all know if we have a problem with something, when people ask me like, do you think I'm addicted to porn? It's like, is there a consequence? Are you feeling like you can no longer get aroused with your partner? You're late for meetings because you're watching porn all the time. It's all you're watching. Like then if it's a problem and you're asking me, like then we can do something about it. So I think that's where we see the challenges around porn when it just escalates to a point where it no longer feels like we have agency over our bodies and our sex life. I was talking to my fiance today about having you on the show. And she was telling me earlier today that there are actually three different female orgasms. And okay. maybe there are more than that, but she was saying that there are three different types. Can you talk about them and how they differ? <laughs> yeah. Because this is something the audience probably yeah. doesn't there's realize. so many different types. The thing is, again, here's what we got to say. The science and the study of female sexuality is in its infant stages. We just discovered while I was writing the book that the clitoris doesn't have 8,000 nerve endings. It has 11,000 nerve endings. We have not studied female sexuality. So I think in my book, I maybe talk about 10 different kinds of orgasms. Well, there's different ways to slice it, but there's the clitoral orgasm, which is the clitoris is the external part of the vagina, which is on the vulva, but it actually has internal clitoral nerve endings. So it's external, but it's also internal. We're still learning this as well, but that's the most common kind of orgasm that a lot of women have had when they're like riding a bike when they're little or they're humping a pillow or they're in the shower. Like some people have had orgasms that way when they're younger. They're like, oh, I know that one. Or they have it when their partner's touching them or they're rubbing up against something. That's a clear orgasm. There's the internal orgasm. That's more of like called the G spot. I call it the G area because I still believe that like it might be a spot, but it's also interwoven with the internal clitoral nerves. And then there's like a blended orgasm you can have when you have both of those at the same time. There's the A spot, there's the P spot, there's an anterior orgasm, which is the anterior wall of the vagina, which is more closer to the front of the vagina. There's the P spot, which is more in the back. I outline all of these in my book. There's all these different kinds of orgasms, but I also didn't want to overwhelm people because I just want people to focus on going back to mindful masturbation. I just want people to focus on what kind of orgasms feel good. Like I just want people to get down the ones that feel good and then we can start to explore. And how you're going to have these orgasms are either with fingers or mouth or toys or maybe with a penis, but yeah, it's going to come from our own exploration. Okay. And one other question along these lines would be, how do you get radically more pleasure out of classic sex positions? Yeah, there's only a few sex positions. I outline these in the book, but I think you have more pleasure by changing up your angles, adding a pillow under your bum, moving like one partner's on the bed and one partner's on standing up, just adjusting your position, moving from the bed to the couch. Another thing is lube. Add lube to every sexual situation. I'm a huge fan of lubricant. It's going to make every position feel better, every kind of sex act feel better, whether you're wet, not wet. It's just a consistent, like wearing sunblock on a cloudy day. Still gotta wear loose lube. And I would say the other thing is adding a toy to any sexual situation makes it better. 
makes it feel good. And toys are for all genders, all body parts. We have so many nerve endings on our body that when you add a little bit of toy, a little bit of lube, you're going to have a whole lot more pleasure. Okay. And then the last question, Emily, would be if there was one takeaway that you would want a reader or a listener to get from your book, what would it be? Good question. Start where you're at today. Like I said, I'm going to say it again, that communication is a lubrication because that's really my most often repeated advice, my best advice. Like, don't be too hard on yourself. It's okay if a lot of this is new for you and just start to, to look at how you're going to communicate with yourself and others about sex from today going forward. It's never too late to start. Okay. Well, Emily, congratulations again on the launch of this great book. And thank you so much for the honor of coming on the show. Thank you for having me, John. I really appreciate it. What a fantastic interview that was with Dr. Emily Morse. And I wanted to thank Emily, Alyssa Fortunato, and Harper Collins for the privilege of having her on today's show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast I did with Mind Valley co-founder Christina Mond Lacchiani about her new book, Becoming Flawless, the key to living an imperfectly authentic life, which exposes the perils of perfectionism and invites us to reclaim our true selves, flaws and all. We learn to use love as currency in a very transactional way. And to earn that currency, we need to do the right things. And when we do the wrong things, we lose the currency. That's the economy of success or chasing success or chasing perfectionism. No, so when we grow up, very often that voice of a loving mother or a caring teacher or sister or a friend is replaced by our own self-talk. We keep doing the same. We think that the only way I can be lovable and worthy if I do the right things, if I keep accomplishing, if I keep being good, good boy, good girl, successful, study well, and so on and so on. It's amazing when people are ambitious. But our ambitions should not be fueled by our need to feel our worth and our need for love. Because once they are fueled by these two things, it's a dead end. The fee for this show is that you share it with family and friends when you find something interesting or useful. If you know someone who is looking to explore their sexuality, then definitely share today's episode. The greatest compliment that you can give us is when you share the show with those that you love and care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. And until next time, go out there and be passion struck.